wants to teach me. Are you afraid? So, Mr. Suckerman, if you can hear me, I just want to start by saying um, it is an honor uh, to have you. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. My name is Craig. Uh, I am the founder programmer of Secret Movie Club. We showed your movie Liquid Sky uh, several weeks ago, and it, I'm sure you've heard this now for 40 years, but it blew the audience's minds. And we're a community of filmmakers and film lovers and we're working to interview filmmakers so that we can be a resource to people who are making movies to hear the stories of how people made great movies. So I just really want to start by thanking. Uh, when you were making Liquid Sky, it, did you have any idea that it would become this cult hit that would last for 40 years? Or were you just trying to make a movie? Did you have any sense that what you were doing was as unique as it turned out to be? Well, uh, i tell you one thing. Of course, nobody was planning this way, but uh, I had a very good friend, Ben Barenholz. Maybe you heard this name because he was a, a first theater owner, then, a, then a, one of the best distributors of independent films, and then a producer himself. But he was... Uh, by the general opinion creator of the of the uh, system of you know really maybe even in, uh, in term uh, I mean midnight shows he created for example nobody made midnight shows before him he was he was the first first official distributor of cult films and independent films so he it just happened with we were friends it had nothing to do with this project but then we wrote the script I gave it to read to him to Ben Barenholz and when he read the script. He asked me one question. It looks like it looks like you plan to make a cult film, and I said, "Well, yes, it's true. I do. I, I did plan. Yes, I plan to make a cult film." So Ben said, "You, you should know. I am the greatest specialist in the world on the subject. It's impossible. Nobody can plan cult film. Cult films are just happening. They are never planned." Well, I don't know if he was absolutely sure what he was saying to me because he tried to produce it. He never managed to raise money. So he he was a producer of Liquid Sky, but he tried to do it. So I think he did believe that it will become a cult film. But, it, but it's, it's happened. It's happened to be a cult film. I, I, you know, that was expected. I never thought in terms how many years it will survive. Uh, well, I guess uh, the entire history of filmmaking is not so long. And we're still watching a lot of silent movies, right? So yes. there is nothing... That's uh, true. In the, in the actually, history of I'm, art. I'm being not only a filmmaker, but in film, film, film lovers from, from the early childhood. Probably for many years, permanently see several... I watch several films a day. It's nothing, you know, it's nothing uh, strange to me to see many films every day. And I love to see old films. And actually, I never felt like, you know, old films worse than new films. Some of old films are more interesting to see today than new films. Oh, agreed. Absolutely. I right. absolutely. Uh, I and and I know I know what you mean. I in fact I'm gonna be watching Fritz Lang's M and F. W. Murnau's The Last Laugh this week. And those are films that are greater than a lot of films that have been made in the last 70 years. So um the the so let's go back now. Uh, you have a really interesting story, and I was reading researching for this in Liquid Sky, and I'll I'll get to some of those questions later, but uh, could you just tell us uh, where you were born, how you grew up, how you got into your love of cinema? Okay, it's a long story, but I try to be short. I was born in Moscow, Soviet Union. I was growing up there, and, uh, you know, in uh, that time in Russia, there were no cameras, even 16 millimeter cameras, there were no... Um, 
Well, nothing. There were no textbooks, actually. There was one textbook on filmmaking written by, by Kulishov, creator of editing and all that, a teacher of Eisenstein. And I just found this old book and studied it and learned, you know, like memorized it. I knew everything in this book. And I never would dream that then I will become a student and the film institute Kulishov will be my professor. So finally, the writer of this book became my professor. But it was a long story because it was very anti-Semitic time. There was one film school in the entire Soviet Union. And uh, they took for director's departments about not more than 15 students a year. Among them were students from the entire Soviet camp, like all the Eastern European countries and all the, all, all the third world countries from, from Africa, from India. And from Russia, they tried to take a prolet children of proletariat. Children of proletariat didn't want to learn filmmaking. But <laughs> and one thing, they, they didn't want to teach Jews because it was very anti-Semitic. So we and this Jews would have been in the, there. was this in the 60s? When was this? Yes, it was in the, in the late 50s and beginning of 60s, right? And, and uh, uh, so I didn't know, I mean, I, I had no chance to get to film school. So I uh, went to, uh, to the uh, construction engineering school because it's for many there were many reasons to go there because I you know I wanted to get a high education I didn't want to go to army I wanted to be an educated person but uh, Eisenstein uh, that was his education Eisenstein learned uh, architecture and civil engineering so so I did the same uh, I, I decided to go to to study the same thing. And probably I wasn't the only one like that at the time, but among, I immediately created the theater there. And among my actors were two people who became the top num number one comedians in Russia, the stars number one. And uh, I, I go on, I, among the people who people who wrote for me, for my the students' cabaret theater, people who became the most popular writers of, of, of comedy in, in Russia. And, and even in a school newspaper, I was writing together with the guy who became one of the most known writers in, in, the, in Russia in Germany. Wow. So, uh, so what, what I'm trying to say that this institute really gave not less actors, writers, and dramatists, and whatever, film, film directors, probably more than, uh, than engineers. How, why it's happened this way, I don't know. Well, I probably can ex explain, but it will be it's a different story. Well, so, no, I'd love so to, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear why do you think that was? I mean, that's fascinating. Yeah. Why do you think so many creative people? As I, as I said, they were taking to film school fees in person a year, and all the creative people tried to find something more creative. Architecture was probably most creative of all the professions that people could get, so it's normal that talented people went there. So uh, I, uh, with my friend, the first film series in the, in the school, in engineering school, we made a, it was called amateur, but you know what was called amateur at this time uh, wouldn't be called amateur in any other place but Russia because we were shooting 35 millimeter. We were shooting 35 millimeter films. And there we, I shoot my first shots with actors, where I store, you know, a fiction shot, which won, which won the first prize in the uh, National Festival in Russia and was nationally released in theaters. And, and some prize in Canada and all over the world. And uh, actually, it was the first independent shoot, shoot in Russia. Nobody knew world independent back, back then in Russia. They still called it called it MSU. And actually, it was sent to international film festivals so where they're transferring it to 16 millimeter. Huh. But we couldn't shoot 16 millimeter. That 16 millimeter cameras appeared in Russia a little bit later. They just didn't exist at this moment. And then they made them, in the beginning, they were not good enough to shoot good films. So, so it still was 35 millimeter, 35 millimeter. So that's how I started my film career. And after that, 
I got to film school. Uh, I got to film school again. Uh, it was many reasons for that. Not, not just that I really was the first, first film director who, without studying in, in, the, in, the, in the school, was, whose film was nationally released. But besides of that, they wanted uh, to get new uh, and new uh, directors to make educational films and science documentaries. And all of people who did it were hacks who knew <laughs> nothing about science. So they decided to make a class of uh, people who already have high education. Yeah, yes, it just was a law. A law was that you, have, you can have only one, one edu high education. You cannot have two high educations because government paid for that. You should work. So, so that's how I got to film school. And I was actually, then I you know, in a sense, the story of Likert Sky starts here because I was the only one who already shot film. And this film school at that moment built their own first news studio. And all the students were shooting their, their films, but none of them had experience, and I had experience. So, so I was invited to help every boy. I became beside the, I, I made films, my own films, which I should make in film school. I made films with other people who need directors, like uh, Department of Cameramen. They need a director, departments for writers, they need a director. So I worked with everybody. Besides, I was helping people who couldn't finish their films. And director of the studio, studio, studio was inviting me, said, saying, Zuckerman, please watch what's the problem there and tell me what do you need to, to solve the problem. I was telling him, like, I need additional five days. And he said, okay, he never discussed with me anything because he knew if I said it will be done on these days and it will be finished. So I started working like a producer of low budget films. I enjoyed it. I didn't know nobody was calling me producer. I had no any credits in this film. I just was helping other students to finish their work. But I learned a lot. You know, I don't know how many shorts I made during, during studying at school. Probably more than hundred, certainly more than hundred. I made a lot of films and, uh, and uh, I learned it throughout. After that, I was sent to work with the studio of science documentaries. And that was a law again. You cannot choose your own work. You was you were sent to because you know I had my second education. I should pay to government for for paying for my studying. I should make science documentaries. I start working there. But I, what I was doing, uh, it is difficult to call documentaries because I kind of, with some other people, we created a new genre. It was a mix of everything, the fiction, animation, science fiction, uh, with some idea which had a connection to science. And in one of my films, uh, well, actually, in all of them, a very famous actor played, and one of them was played the star number one in Russia, who played two roles in this film, uh, which was okay, I mean, from all points of view, besides one, they permitted me to make films like that, but they didn't change budget. Budget were standard. It was standards for a documentary. So the budget standard for the documentary, I was make, make fiction with number one top star, paying him for two roles. <laughs> so again, what I really did, I was studying how to make low budget films. When I was a little kid, it just was men beating up by other children in the streets. That's, mm. But then I was a big one. I mean, like I was a, was a film major, my name was uh, Zuckerman, some Jewish, I, could, I couldn't have an important film. Uh, a lot of a lot of times, uh, like famous writers who wanted me to make the film, they went to great to, to big authorities, demanding me to be a director, but always getting the same answer. Actually, they were not against me doing it. I just should should make two things in order to make any film I want. Not any. Well, nobody could make any film they want. I mean, the films which were permitted to make, but big enough. Uh, I should change my name to Russian sounding and to become a member of Communist Party. Huh. And I never agreed to that. But it's actually the way, uh, way to make a 
feature, big feature film and a big studio was practically mm-hmm. close to me. So everybody expected me to change name and to become a member of a party, but I never did. I was very successful. My mm-hmm. films were getting prizes. I really was like accepted as a, one of the best directors at the studio. I, uh, I was very successful. Then immigration started, and I decided that I want to immigrate. It was pretty complicated uh, because, you know, it was risky. You apply for immigration. Instead of that, you can get to Siberia instead of right. or just stay without job for many years. And, uh, well. So first, first thing I did, I left the job at the studio and started working like... Uh, self-employed for television. And actually it was very good for me because I made several uh, very different from science documentary films. I made a comedy, which was very funny and things like that. And uh, and then I immigrated, uh, came to Israel. And in Israel, uh, and in Israel was very uh, uh, kind of a, very lucky story because I started working in three uh, in three months after I came to Israel. I and mean, in three months I spent in school studying language, which was very uh, difficult. Actually, I, I was from childhood. I was very bad at foreign languages. Huh. Now I'm speaking English and I'm writing scripts in English. But if somebody told me that that I was a teenager, I would never believe because I was always always one of the worst in studying language. In film school, after, after you know, after, after high school and two high educations, I mean, altogether I was studying everything, including English, for more, probably 20 years. I don't know, very, all my young years, and I never could, could learn it. At my last examination in film school, I couldn't remember the word good. I forgotten good. So I would never dream that I will, will live in America and speak in English and write in English. But that's happened, and, you know, and that's very interesting. That's a separate, separate. It is. There's, you've led such a, the, before we get to, to Israel and then the move to New York, I just want to ask one more question about your early period. Did I hear you correctly? Did you say that one of your teachers was Kulshoff? Right. He was my director, teacher of director. Right? I mean, that's that's incredible. That's one of the biggest like grandfathers of uh, of cinema. And my question to you is just not to spend too much time there. But what did you learn from him? What was it like studying under Kulshoff? That'd be like studying under Eisenstein. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what he was telling, speaking about directing. It's really difficult to tell because, as I said to you, I really, being a teenager, I, I, I memorized his book. So practically, it was very difficult for him to tell something new, which he knew, which I didn't knew before, because I read his book, not read, I memorized his book. So, so but uh, as a personality, he was from, actually, I think that most of teachers teach mostly not uh, skill, but personality. Personality is more important. His personality was tremendous. His and his wife, Hachlova, who was a star of all his films, who was uh, one of the most interesting personalities of 20th in Russia. So, and they were not so old as we can think, because actually, I think, like, he created all this, his ideas and was teaching, uh, teaching uh, Eisenstein. He was very, very young. I think he started his creative work like being 15 or something like that. He wasn't so old that he was my teacher, which is very, very, very strange to huh. know that this person really. It's, uh, you know, I mean, uh, and that's what we, our conversation started, that film, film art is really very young art. Right. Then I came to, even then I came to America, practic- practically most of stars of science movies were still alive. Basically moving on, so you went to Israel and you were approved for immigration to Israel. And then how did you get to New York? Okay, then I get to Israel, and as I said, I started working for Israeli television and three months after I came to Israel. It's a very interesting story by itself, but that will never finish because all my life my life was many, many changes. Uh, 
I started my film, which I expected less, less of all, but I was taken to work with Israeli television by a new head of a documentary department who was very nice, talented, and interesting person, Egal Lawson. And he said to me, that he always thought that should be done films about different religions, representative different religion in Jerusalem, and that I should make film about Russian Orthodox Church in Jerusalem. I said, I left Russia to make a Jewish subject. <laughs> and he said, you cannot make Jewish subject. You just came. If you make Jewish subject, everybody would laugh. You know nothing about Jewish subject. But this subject, you know better than anybody in, in, in Israel. So we will do it. And it really was very interesting work. I made this film, and this film was tremendously successful. It got first prize in the Hollywood Festival of TV Films, which this festival doesn't exist anymore, but then it was very big. And it really was so successful in Israel that statistics shows that 40% of Israelis seen my film about the Russian church in Jerusalem. Hmm. So it became very famous. Then I made another film and several short films. And then I realized, uh, I learned one thing, which is now very, very different. It's, uh, uh, back then, Israel was, was, had three million population. Now it's more than seven, I think. So it's two different countries today and back then. And filmmaking, I think, film industry needs audience. Country with three million, uh, only, uh, three million people cannot have cannot have film industry. So Israeli films may really go very very low level for non-educated audience, or had no audience at all. We were good films, nobody seen them because there were no place to show them. It's not a place to plan your life to be filmmaker. <laughs> Another thing. Uh, I didn't know life at all. And actually, I had, uh, two, I had three friends who came from different countries. One is from Russia, who was famous director in Russia. Another who came from Poland. And the third who came from Italy. And all of them made their first film before I came to Israel, first Israeli films. And none of these films I've seen, they were ashamed of these films. Mm -hmm. they, made, they started making fiction films without knowing life. That's, so I understood that that's impossible. You need to spend several years in the country in order to become able to make fiction films, which is, sounds very strange. You can make a documentary the first day you came to. I mean, documentary doesn't need you to be realist. You really show what you see. It's about you. It's your, your impression. Huh. Feature film, fiction films are different. They need, you cannot do it. Do, do fiction films without knowing real life in the country and make film. So that I learned as well. So I understood, and, and, and the third reason, the young Israeli filmmakers started filmmaking in America or in England, they knew the entire world, not only small Israel. And I never been, I've been only in Russia and Israel. I understood in this situation, I have no chance to become a good filmmaker in Israel. I already was famous, but I, I could make a good, good fiction, fiction film. So I decided that I have no choice but to, to go to other place. And after, after some uh, thinking, I understood that the uh, best of all is New York. I already been in Los Angeles for a couple of film festivals. Uh, I understood that nobody at that moment, there were no person in Hollywood who came not from English, English-speaking country, there were people from England and from Australia who made films, but nobody who came from non-English-speaking country and made their first film. It just didn't work this way. I understood that my main, uh, my main plus is my knowledge of making low-budget films. I know how to make low-budget films. So I decided to go to New York and study life and write new, new and new scripts and try to, to raise money. And finally, then I, I uh, write a better script and I find a, a way to, I will know my limit, how much money I can raise. That will happen. And Liquid Sky was exactly uh, the same because there were several projects before Liquid Sky, which, uh, which didn't work 
for some reasons. There was one science fiction project called Sweet 16, right before Liquid Sky. And actually, Bob Brady, who is playing, uh, playing in Liquid Sky, acting, acting teacher, who was, a, who was a, he played himself. He was acting teacher and casting director for low budget films. So I met him. He was a casting director for my previous project, which never happened. But we started, we made a lot of casting with him. And I met a lot of his students and Carvalho among them. We became friends, a lot of them. And then investor who wanted to finance the science fiction film Sweet 16 uh, invited a very good production manager. And very good production manager read, read the script and said, well, you, you are ready to give only half a billion. There is no way to make this film for half a billion. Now, Zuckerman saying that he can make it for half a billion. Well, who... Whom you would believe, Zuckerman, who came from Russia and Israel, or me, who is the best production manager in, uh, in New York. Certainly, he, he believed him. Uh, I mean, he was right for making it the usual way. It's probably impossible. It was impossible to make this film for this budget. But I would certainly make it. If, if, so, so project stopped after it was casted, that, you know, Several famous people were going to participate there. Even Andy Warhol was going to play there. I, I wrote a special role for Andy Warhol, but this project never was done. And then I understood that I need to write a script which would be easy to prove that it can be done for half a million because I realized that half a million, that's the top I can raise at this moment in, in New York. So this way, so I decided to write a script which will be written for actors I already have, for locations I already have, and so on and so on. And that was the idea of Liquid Sky, an idea that everybody I know in Bob Brady's friends and students will play some roles there, including Bob Brady himself. And I was uh, deciding who would be uh, At that moment, another my friend came from Russia, Yuri Neyman, the cameraman, the director of photography, whom I knew very long from his 15 years, and he was 15 years old and student then, back then he already was shooting very beautiful films. I wanted him to immigrate, then I immigrated, but he decided that no, he first need to make a successful film in Russia. Which he did, he made successful films in Russia. And after that, he migrated exactly at the moment and I planned to make Liquid Sky. And he, besides being director of photography, always uh, did special effects. I myself love special effects a lot, and in all my low budget films, I made special effects myself. So we were two people, you know, ready to make low budget special effects related film. Practically, I think the list of special effects I knew we can make existed before we started writing the script. I knew what special effects should be included. And then when we were editing film and shooting special effects at the same time, the last special effects was shot at the last day of editing. So it was very good pre-planned. Well, you, 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 there's so much that you're saying that... The, one question I just want to ask here is you were talking about how back in Russia you were creating a new kind of genre with your science documentaries. They weren't quite documentary. They were fiction. They were abstract. They were avant-garde or, or artistic. And there's a feeling of that in Liquid Sky. Do you think that that some of what you were doing in Russia carried over into how you approach Liquid Sky? I think it had to do with uh, a lot to do with my character. I, well, I loved doing it. I loved mixing genres. And the Liquid Sky, actually, the same Ben Barinholtz, who was one of the distributors, said that it, the film never will work commercially because it's a mix of genres. And commercially work only clean genre films. If you mix genres, audience don't like it. Well, uh, I probably I would listen to him if I could, but it's not my, you know, that's what I like. I love mix of genres. So I always did it and I always will do it because that's that's me. <laughs> but as when think, for example, all the psychedelic quality of Liquid Sky, I almost liked what I did know was psychedelic in Russia, but I almost like like very color 
intense color, intense films. Being a, a child, I had a dreams, very colorful dreams, which I used to call American films. Huh. Why I call them American films? I have no idea. Well, I have idea because what what American films have said be between uh, Disney Bambi. Disney Bambi obviously was very colorful film, right? 